ευχαριστήσω χρόνια πολλά ε, για του Έλληνε που βρίσκονται στο κοινό μα. Uh, it's a great pleasure that you host uh, Professor Nikias, a Renaissance man, coming from the US uh, for us here. We are very privileged to have him as a speaker. Before I give you um, the floor, Professor Nikias, and to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, I would like to welcome Ms. Kirtata for a special uh, introduction of, on the part uh, of uh, Les Caritas Foundation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Ekaterin Laskaridis Foundation. We are very happy to host uh, in our historical library today's event, a lecture by Professor uh, Chrysostomus Nikias on Xenophon, which will be followed by a very interesting discussion. Today's event is organized by the University of Piraeus, with which we have a long-standing and fruitful collaboration. Uh, we are happy that you, all, you are all today with us. Um, Feel free to take a look around at our uh, historical library and our exhibition of rare books after the lecture. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Bozzi, who is today's moderator, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I have the privilege of sitting among um, very esteemed guests. Uh, I'll start with uh, Professor Nikias on my left, Professor Tiab Aristoteles Tiabris uh, uh, next to me, uh, Professor uh, Melina Tamiolakin, uh, Professor and Dean of uh, the School of uh, uh, Economic Business and International Studies of the University of Piraeus, uh, Mr. Athanasios Platias, uh, whom I would like now to uh, uh, introduce to you for a special welcome. Uh -huh. On behalf of the School of Economics, Business and International Studies, I would like to welcome you in today's discussion. But first of all, I have to thank the Lascaridis Foundation for being so generous with us, but giving us this beautiful uh, auditorium for our lectures, not only today, but in the last five years continuously. So thank you. Oh, we'd like to thank the Foundation for the support. We are really privileged to welcome one member of our department because he holds, Professor Nikias, uh, holds an honorary degree from our department. And I remember when he received his degree, he talked about leadership and ancient wisdom. And uh, his point was that we have really to look back in order to look forward. So we have to look at the ancient test. And actually, uh, to, today's to talk will be on this issue. And uh, we're really privileged to have with us Professor Tamiolaki, uh, which is an expert on ancient writers, uh, I knew her from the bibliography on Thucydides, but she's also an expert on Xenophon. So oh, we are looking forward for a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Platias. And I would like to ask uh, the, pre the chair of the Department of International and European Studies, Professor Siabiris, to say his welcome note. For Professor Sostomos Nikias and you very much. Professor Tamiolaki. Um, so, first of all, let me just uh, once again, as I always do, start by thanking the Las Caridas Foundation. Uh, I have a saying this place makes us give our A game because we just feel different. It transcends us. And if you're an academic, it does not get any better in this part of the world. So thank you very much, uh, Las Caridas Foundation, for your continuous uh, support for our endeavors. Today is special. And I heard my mentor, Professor Platias, mention uh, a lecture that actually had a big impact, and that is not always the case. So several years ago, we were privileged, because the honor was ours, to present uh, Professor, President, Renaissance man, Chrysostomos uh, uh, Max Nikias, with an honorary doctorate. 
And uh, I think he was standing right here, and we don't feel worthy, obviously. And he presented this wonderful lecture on ancient leadership. And at the end of that lecture, and for weeks, months, even years, we've been talking. Yes, we teach Thucydides. Uh, we kind of know these things, but Xenophon, not really. We are missing Xenophon from our curriculum, from our thinking, from our reading list, from our personal research. And when someone is so persuasive in his or her arguments, when someone opens up new paths of knowledge, of insight, of inquiry, that is rare and that has consequences. So today, and in academia, we have, uh, it's not like the new cycle. We tend to move in, especially departments, in years. So it takes some years to think, read, write. Today is stage two because Professor President Nikias, you know, he has so many, um, I mean, I don't know, our friend and part of our family, uh, uh, Professor Nikias, is going to deliver a lecture on Xenophon and just one book of Xenophon's, which is, and we'll talk about this, the first time you read it, you will go, what am I doing? And then it necessitates immediately a second reading. We'll talk about that because just when you thought you were done with it and you're like, okay, I'm done, then the final pages it basically changed the whole story, and then you have to go back and rethink, and it's a major work of art and a major contribution to, um, to what? We'll discuss about that because what is the Sarupadia? What exactly is it? We'll talk about that as well. Stage three, so this will be, I, I, I'm eagerly awaiting, uh, not just, uh, I have notes of pa uh, pages of notes, but I really want to see what's in here. And uh, stage three, I think, is gonna be when we start, when we do a major conference and uh, we produce uh, publications based on Xenophon. I'm, I'm not gonna steal any thunder, but all I'm gonna say is that Xenophon is a strange author in many ways. He's not straightforward, he's very prolific, he writes different genres of, of books. So you have the historian, you have uh, um, the, the person who writes technical pamphlets to almost two and a half thousand years ago, 2,400 years ago. And then you have the author of Kirupedia. What is this book? One thing that he does clearly is he does not tell us what he's doing. We need to ponder, and people have been pondering for thousands of years trying to figure out this book. It's wonderful. Plato devoted an entire book of his laws basically trying to refute his understanding of Kirupedia. Um, we have, uh, we've talked about this. Maybe Alexander the Great uh, read this book. He did, I'm sure. I mean, we don't know, but we do. He certainly read the book. Um, what are the consequences? Why has it not been in vogue for about 150 years? Does that even matter? Should it matter? Many questions. And most of all, what is it about? I think that in the title of uh, Professor Nikias' lecture, we get a big hint, and I think we're gonna have a lot to learn because at the end of the day, this book, the genre we'll discuss, is about, clearly, leadership and its pitfalls. And last point, we read books. We have an advantage here in Greece, which is being lost in countries even like the US today. There's a bias. Oh, this book was written two and a half thousand years ago. Is it really relevant? was written by a white male, and could that be relevant? They had slaves, true, awful. Uh, should we be reading people who don't even bother to uh, talk about the immense injustices? 
why, how come women are not that um, uh, protagonistic? Although in Quiropedia, well, I'm not sure we can say that there's, that there are a few stories. So there's a, there's a bias against these kind of authors uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in my view, obviously you should be very objective and castigate, condemn uh, the barbarity and injustice of the era, but not throw away, as the proverbial saying goes, the baby with a tub of water, because there's substance there. Final, 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 final point. Quiropedia is about the founding of an empire. We don't like empires, do we? No. This is a more democratic age, although this is changing a bit, but empires and princes and kings and absolute monarchs, oh, that's so 17th century, right? But what are the real leaders, monarchs, emperors of the 21st century? Sure, there are people who are still kings, but I think there are other areas where leadership of that magnitude does matter and hence can learn from Quiropedia. I'll just throw a name and I'll end it there, Elon Musk, for example. So with, without further ado, I can't wait to listen to this lecture. We, are going to ha we have some of the best experts. We are gonna criticize, we're gonna contemplate, but this is just an opening, opening salvo for what is gonna be a big conference, maybe even uh, a, um, a world conference, Pacos Mucinetrio, on Xenophon, which we, we have the resources and we're gonna do, and our own publications that are gonna come. Professor Palazzo, we've been talking late at night uh, over the phone, maybe with a glass or more of whiskey, maybe, okay. But uh, it's coming, it's coming. We're, we're gonna come up with our own publications sooner rather than later. What an honor, and let me acknowledge our students, our, the, so many members of, my, of our department, on a glorious day, for an event that's also being broadcast uh, online, so a lot of people don't even have to come here to benefit from it, and yet they are here. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, online audience. Thank you, in-house audience. Most of all, thank you, President Nikias. Thank you very much. Uh, as you noticed on the invitation, this event is being organized by the Department of International and European Studies of the University of Piraeus and the Council for International Relations, where uh, Professor Nikias is also head of the International Advisory Board, and I would like to thank him publicly for supporting both organizations uh, in, his, uh, in many ways with his contributions and with his presence here in Greece. As I said in the beginning, and as uh, uh, Professor Tsiabiris underlined, uh, Chrysostomos Nikias is a Renaissance man and he also combines something that it is uh, until now possible only in America, namely to be at the same time professor of humanities and engineering. <laughs> he used to be the president of the University of Southern California, I don't think that this has anything to do with this because he is now holding the Malcolm Curie chair of technology but he has a vast experience on how to run a university so he can talk on education, he can talk about uh, ancient classical uh, texts, he can talk about engineering and microchips, and we've had him here last year talking about uh, these issues. So I think really that uh, his wisdom and uh, character have uh, uh, a great um, reflection on the topic we're going to discuss today as it is a study on leadership, uh, Xenophon's Kirupedia, and it is a study on the way a man uh, created not only a vast empire, but created a vast empire that le lived through time, to live through history, and inspired Xenophon to write that about 200 years after uh, the death of um, Cyrus the Great, because uh, what we learn from his writings is not only what he learned, but mainly how he became wise and how he uh, became a, a character that's still of great interest for us. So Machiavelli was right to study Xenophon and, and we're going to hear more about that uh, from you. Professor Sosomos Dikias, please, you have the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. Um, it's uh, hello, everyone. Kalispera says, Kronja Bola. It's truly a pleasure to be here and uh, 
the Las Caridis Foundation Library. I have very, very fond memories from the honorary degree uh, ceremony, and even last year, giving the lecture on semiconductor chips among one of the, that was the topic. Uh, but, uh, and also to Professor Damio Laiki, thank you so much, all the way from Crete, uh, being with us uh, today. Uh, who, by the way, uh, she's a world-renowned scholar uh, on the classics and uh, I would say on Xenophon, too. Uh, <clears throat> I discovered her through her publications and that's how we, we got to know each other. Let me begin with a little bit of story uh, before I get into my lecture for today. Uh, and that was six years, seven years ago, uh, <clears throat> I was president of USE and uh, I had invited uh, General Jim Mattis, the famous General Mattis uh, uh, of, the, of the Marine Corps. Uh, he was the first Secretary of Defense for the Trump administration. But that was before he got the appointment. I invited him to come and speak to our veteran uh, students at USE. So he walked into my office, it was the first time to meet him a wonderful, very sweet man. And uh, of course there is an iron steel behind all the sweetness. Uh, but uh, we sat down and uh, he had a little piece of paper, he takes it out and the pen. He looked at me and he said, uh, oh, what are your principles of leadership that you apply in your everyday work uh, here? and then he was getting ready to start writing. I have to say that uh, I was very surprised. I didn't expect that. I had to be very quick on my feet what answer I give him. And, uh, and I said, I said, General Marius, I, I really go back to the classics. And I said, in particular, Xenophon spoke, uh, Cyropedia, the education of Cyrus. Uh, how do you spell Xenophon? So he writes it down, I tell him, and Cyropedia. And then I kind of walked him a, a five minute quick overview, what the book is all about and why it's considered to be the Bible on leadership. Well, I have to tell you, and that's why I'm sharing the story with you, two months later from his Gmail personal email address, he sends me an email and says, Max, I'm halfway through Cyropedia, and I love it. Thank you. That was the email. And then a few, uh, a few weeks later, the announcement was made that he was going to be Secretary of Defense. So it's a privilege uh, for me to be here again with all of you. And today I would like to take a look at a topic that is important for all of us, the art and adventure of leadership. I techni kei peripetia igesias. And I would like us to explore the qualities that make uh, great leaders, the challenges they face, and the impact they can have on their organizations and society as a whole. We should begin, of course, by acknowledging the central dilemma Leadership doesn't have to be difficult. Actually, it can be very easy. If I am your leader and all of you unanimously agree, this is what we are going to do and that's the direction you are gonna take. And if all of you ag agree right away, the leadership is very easy. But of course, they, there is no way that all of us here in this room, we are going to agree on one direction. And when people don't agree on the direction that their leader wants to take them, then the fireworks begin. For this reason, leadership and management training and publishing are massive business today. American organizations spent about $25 billion annually on executive training, management, leadership, and education. 
by one estimate, and I have the reference if anyone is interested in reading more about it, by one estimate, there are more than 16,000 leadership books, manuals, articles published every year in the United States alone. With so much information available, even the top experts cannot agree on the core issues. For instance, to what extent can a leader convince followers or coerce followers? And yet, everyone who aspires to lead wants to know how to motivate and inspire others. Throughout my life and career, and that is already said, I have gained the best advice about leadership from the ancient classics. I have personally learned a great deal. If you read these books from a leadership perspective, I have personally learned from the works of Xenophon, of Aristotle, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, Cicero, and many others of the Greco-Roman classical era. For example, let's take Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. From Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, we learn the traits of heroic leaders, the inspiration and courage of Ajax, the risk-taking and bravery of Achilles, the cunning of Odysseus, the wisdom of Nestor, the justice of Agamemnon. So all these virtues collectively may define the ideal leader. We also learn much from the plays of Sophocles, such as Antigone, Oedipus Tyrannus, Ajax, and Philoctetes, which illustrate the tensions leaders face choosing, for example, between what is ethical versus what is legal, between short-term goals versus long-term objectives, between the rights of individuals versus the rights of the majority, and between choosing to tolerate one kind of evil in order to prevent a larger one. These tensions haunt all leaders. And these plays illustrate leaders who actually solve a crisis and get things done. But at the end, they get no credit. In the end, they are no longer needed uh, and are ultimately abandoned. However, if there is one thing that we have learned from the thousands of books that have been written on leadership is this. No two experts fully agree on anything. Yet we still have an obligation to find some light to illumine our way. This is no easy fit because we have so much noise around us. All of us here today have witnessed one of the greatest revolutions in human history. A digital media and communication revolution that allows almost anyone to connect instantly to anyone else on the planet. The result has been an unprecedented explosion of information and social media platforms. This has made it easy for all of us to stay in constant contact with our organizations, our direct reports, our families. And you might think that it would make leading or managing an organization easier than never before. Wrong. Think again. It becomes even harder to scream out the noise and to find meaningful sources of light. So how do we do this? I personally believe we must return to the often neglected sources, the timeless wisdom found in the classical works of our civilization for a very simple reason. Times change, but human nature is still the same. It never changes. 
And the Bible on leadership was written almost 2,400 years ago. It is Xenophon's Kyrupedia, Cyropedia, which was written around 365 BC. It, may, it might have been the last book that Xenophon wrote, or at least one of the last ones, because he passed away a few years later. Xenophon's account of the life of Cyrus of Persia influenced Alexander the Great, Cicero, Machiavelli. Machiavelli makes extensive references to Cyropedia in his prints. The United States founding fathers, all of them were educated by Scottish teachers of the Scottish Enlightenment who came from Scotland to the colonies, and they were all taught Cyropedia. And the countless books and articles written in our times. Peter Drager, <clears throat> the renowned leadership and management expert, expert, who, by the way, wrote 39 books on management. He's considered the management expert of the 20th century. And actually, I met him as a much older man back in the 1980s, and I attended one of his lectures. Uh, he was a very charismatic speaker, very popular. So he said, the first systematic book on leadership is Xenophon's Kiru Pedia. And that book is still the best book on the subject. It's all in there. In other words, this is what he said, that why I write about management, where do I learn leadership? I read Cyropedia. We need to remember that Xenophon's Cyrus is based on some historical events that took place. But it is not the Cyrus referred to by Herodotus, Petrarch, Boccaccio, and others, who was a wicked king who fell in battle and whose head was chopped off. Xenophon's Cyrus, in many ways, you have to see it as Xenophon's prince, dies in advanced age, in bed, surrounded by family and friends. Many parts of their work are highly fictionalized, and the dialogues that contain many lessons of leadership are all fictionalized by Xenophon. Cyropedia describes Cyrus's lineage, his personality, his character traits, the education he received, his military campaigns and alliances, and of course, the big prize at the end, his conquest of Babylon in 539 BC, and the establishment of the ancient world's first large empire. This is the empire established by Cyrus, based, of course, on historical events. But this is the empire established by Xenophon's Cyrus. And you can see that Marathon and Salamis, there were two battles on the very, very periphery on this very large empire. This book, uh, when you read it, it is engaging, it is comprehensive. The character, the beliefs, the techniques for success, and doesn't trivialize the lessons of leadership. Xenophon portrays his prince as a tolerant and ideal leader who was called the father of his people by the ancient Persians. He promotes, so his prince promotes diversity, rewards meritocracy, values human rights, and is the liberator of the Jews who were captive in Babylon. But why, I mean, we have to ask ourselves, why did Xenophon pick Cyrus of Persia and not a Greek leader of antiquity? Why did he not write, for example, 
the education of Pericles, or the education of Themistocles, or even more importantly, his favorite one, the education of Agesilaus. We can only speculate. Cyrus the king was a famous figure in Greece. Xenophon liberated his ideas from Greek figures. He was very familiar with the Persian culture and customs. Why? Because he was part of the expedition of the 10,000 to Persia. And then he was the one elected by the 10,000 to be the general to lead them back to their homeland. Going through a treacherous winter through the mountains of Armenia and all that until they ended up reaching uh, the, uh, uh, the Black Sea. So, in other words, the 10,000 Greeks in the middle of Persia, they must have seen something on the 29-year-old Xenophon to elect him as their general to lead them back to their homeland. We can also speculate because the result of, oh, uh, so he, that's why he was very familiar with the Persian culture and customs because he'd been there, he's been there. And the distance in time allowed him to capture the story as a historical novel. Xenophon wrote it 165 years after Cyrus's death. It's like in the United States, writing today about Ulysses Grant, or here in Greece, writing about General Macriyanis, for example. But can we also speculate, and I'm looking at Professor Tamiolaki here, can we also speculate that actually writing his prince, his Cyrus, was writing about himself and his leadership experiences as metaphors in a historical novel? We can only speculate. In Cyropedia, Xenophon emphasized a stark reality. And actually, you read that in the first few pages when you start reading the book. No task is more difficult for a human being than to rule over other human beings. All other species of animals, he said, are easier to govern than the human species. The late leadership expert, Water Bennis, who was a professor at USC and a good friend, once wrote a book called Managing People is Like Hurting Cats. Xenophon thinks leadership is even harder than that. Why? Because people are very difficult to lead. Instability and conflict are constant facts of life. Government and institutions will collapse and they will need to be replaced. Thus leaders must always, always be comfortable with uncertainty. Life as a leader is inevitably in turmoil constantly. Professor Norman uh, Sandridge uh, points out that in Cyropedia, Xenophon describes his Cyrus as nature made him most fair to look upon and set in his heart the threefold, love of humanity, love of learning, and love of honor. He would endure all labors. He would undergo all danger for the sake of glory. In other words, Xenophon says that nature made his Cyrus to be philanthropotados, in other words, Xenophon claims that leaders demonstrate these three distinct personality traits even as children. The first of these traits, philodemia, this is the love of being honored, of being praised by others. Leaders love popularity at least up to a point, because this gives them the drive to persevere and to take chances. Someone lacking philodemia 
may eventually be driven away from leadership because of the headaches that come with the responsibilities. The second trait is philomathia, the love of learning. This involves curiosity, passion, and thirst to constantly increase one's knowledge in the service of one's organization or community. Let's keep in mind that leaders are all self-educated. And the third necessary trait is philanthropia. At a practical level, this means taking pleasure in the company of other people, mingling with them, socializing, having a desire to understand other people's challenges, either good or bad, caring about others, not being overly self-centered. And I can share a little story with you when I gave uh, a lecture on Xenophon Cyropedia at the university, I had one of my brilliant professors, who by the way, he still aspires that one day he may win the Nobel Prize. And he comes to me after the lecture and he says, Max, finally, after all these years, you put me in peace with myself. Thanks to Xenophon, you put me in peace with myself. Because I always believed I can also do leadership and that, and I, I never did. And he says, I realize today I have two out of the three traits. Philodemia, yeah, that's the driving force for me. I want to win a Nobel Prize one day or be recognized because of my research. Uh, Philomathestados, sure. Uh, and uh, that's the part of the research and keep reading. But he says, I don't care about the problems of other people. I don't want to spend any time understanding the problems of other people, okay? But if you don't have that as a trait, then leadership is not for you. Because constantly, you're gonna be addressing, solving problems of, of an organization and other people. So one of Cyropedia's main lessons is that leadership involves serious education and training. If you read the book, and probably we can discuss a little bit later during our panel discussion, Education of Cyrus is book one out of eight in Cyropedia. And yet we have as a title of the book what should have been the title of chapter one out of the eight. So the speculation I get is that emphasis is placed that leadership involves serious education and training. If you have those three traits, you can build on these key qualities. And they must be constructed and perfected over time with the care and attention of an artist. One of the most important qualities in a leader is self-restraint, autoengradia. According to Xenophon, taking on the burden of self-restraint is what separates a leader from a follower. The leader is driven by a desire for honor, but without self-restraint, he can lose all honor. Self-restraint regarding the pleasures of the body, food, drink, sex, drugs, and sleep. And self-restraint regarding the emotions of the body, fear, pity, anger, lust. Leaders are especially vulnerable here. By the very public nature of their duties, they are exposed to many, many social gatherings and factions. Consequently, very strict discipline is required to control not only the use of food or alcohol, but also social interactions with other people. The leader must be friendly without getting too close to anybody. Xenophon's Cyrus' self-restraint was tested even when he was a young boy in his grandfather's court. And it was tested again when he refused much later, building the empire and winning the one battle after the other. His uh, self-restraint was tested when he refused to see Princess Panthea, who was a very beautiful woman and he was in tears 
when Princess Panthea committed suicide, uh, learning about the death of her husband. So in Cyropedia, Cyrus admits feeling vulnerable to erotic desire, greed, and pride, all of which he tries to control carefully. It seems like every week we read about leaders who have been distracted by the pleasures or emotions of the body. CEOs of companies, Hollywood celebrities, professional athletes, and politicians. The news yesterday, NBC Universal Studios, a big uh, Hollywood mogul, uh, Jeff Shell, resigned yesterday, surprisingly resigned instantly. He was fired and uh, because uh, he exhibited inappropriate behavior to another woman employee of the company. Lack of self-restraint. It leads to their downfall and to the sort of public humiliation that is the very opposite of the quest for honor that motivated them in the first place. Our next uh, sp uh, speaker, Professor Damio Laghi, has done exceptional academic scholarship on the subject of emotions. She points out that Aristotle believed there were seven cardinal emotions, anger, friendship, fear, shame, gratitude, pity, and envy. And that is important for leaders to be aware of these emotions and their social dimensions in order to be more persuasive to their followers. And she states, and I'm quoting her, knowledge of the art of leadership also includes knowledge of handling the emotions of others as well as your own. It is very true and sometimes very challenging, especially mastering the emotions of your followers. You can see the emotions of the Greek population after the, the tragic accident of, uh, of the train, uh, Statembi. Those are the emotions that we're talking about. And uh, uh, if being a successful leader requires all of these things, it begs the question, are great leaders born or made? People, we know very well today, people do not enter the world with equal abilities and talents. Each one of us, we didn't enter the world with exactly the same abilities and talents. Xenophon's uh, prince exhibits the three character traits as a child, implying that nature gave him those gifts, gave those gifts to the child to be philanthropodados, philomathestados, and philodimodados. Peter Drager, going back to him, the father of management, pointed out that leadership does require talent. This gift, he said, is rare. So he implies that it requires the talent to be given to you by nature. However, Professor Waterben is another guru on leadership at USC, believes strongly in the argument that is nurture and not nature. And he wrote, the most dangerous leadership myth is that leaders are born, that there is a genetic factor to leadership. This myth asserts that people simply either have certain charismatic qualities or not. This is nonsense. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are made rather than born. That's, that was what a Benesis view. So which is it? Are great leaders made or born? Let's look at first at those clearly born with extraordinary natural gifts. And probably the most famous prodigy of all time may be Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And yet, Mozart had an astonishing work ethic. In her book, The Creative Habit, 
choreographer Tuila Tharp wrote, nobody worked harder than Mozart. By the time he was 28 years old, his hands were deformed because of all the hours he has spent practicing, performing, and gripping a quill pen to compose. That's the missing element in the popular portrait of Mozart. Beyond musical prodigies, some are born with incredible athletic talents. Take, for example, Usain Bolt, perhaps the greatest Olympic uh, sprinter of all time. In 2003, scientists discovered that Bolt possessed a gene, the ACTN3, that gave elite athletes a performance advantage. However, when I later read that one of the study's researchers posted on a science blog, I, I really had to laugh. The researcher wrote, it is almost certainly true that Usain Bolt carries at least one of the sprint variants of the ACTN3 gene. But then, so do I, along with around millions of other humans worldwide. It takes more than a gene to create an Olympian. That study was perfectly consistent, in my opinion, with Xenophon's ideas, as well as the title of his book, Kiru Pedia. Education and training are more important than nature, assuming you begin with a genetic advantage. Years ago, I had a conversation. He was one of our big donors at the University of Southern California, Dr. Gary Michelson, a brilliant inventor, an entrepreneur. Uh, he published more than 1,000 patents. He was a medical doctor, orthopedic surgeon, and uh, <clears throat> he's worth today more than a couple of billion dollars. <laughs> and uh, he was a big donor to our university. But I had a conversation with him about Xenophon. And uh, uh, we discussed Aeropedia. I was educating him. He didn't know about the book. And uh, the importance of education and training. If you are given by nature a little bit of advantage. And he said to me, he called me one day, and he said, you know, Xenophon is right. Let me tell you, you got to see the documentary that was made on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, the famous basketball player. And uh, arguably, Michael Jordan was the best basketball player of all times. So when the team, the Chicago Bulls, won with Michael Jordan their very first NBA championship, all the players, the coaches, were celebrating uh, on the court, opening the champagne bottles. And then after all these celebrations, all the players realized Michael Jordan wasn't with them. And they went looking for him. And then they went back in the locker room. And it was dark. There were no lights. And Michael Jordan was sitting in the locker room. And they found him crying like a baby. And the Jordan said to them, I know I have worked very hard for this, but I just wanted this moment alone to thank God for giving me the talent to do this. I believe God is nature, but it was Jordan's incredible work ethic that was the nurture. To be so successful in any endeavor, you need to have both. You need God-given ability, but you also need the knowledge and experience that help you make the most of what you have been given. If athletes and musical prodigies are born with talents that can be improved with training, is it possible leaders also have natural gifts? So the very first genetic study on leadership was performed by a group in 2013, exactly 10 years ago, was published by a study, a genetic study, at the University College in London. 
And the researchers claimed, as a result of their study, that they have discovered a genotype, the RS4950, that particular genotype, which was connected to leadership ability across generations. And the lead author of the study wrote, the conventional wisdom that leadership is a skill remains largely true, but we show it is also in part a genetic trait. And what they did, they took uh, two groups of people, 4,000 is the one group and the 4,000 the other group. The one group, they had some kind of a leadership position in a corporation, in the community, anywhere. They had some kind of a management leadership position. And the other 4,000, they didn't. And for these 8,000 people, they did, for each one of them, their DNA sequencing. And then they were comparing. And they found that this genotype, RS4950, was important. And the researchers concluded that having a double A allele on the RS4950, it would give you more than a 40% advantage getting a leadership position versus a double G allele on the RS4950 that will give you 30% advantage. But if you have an, AG, uh, if you have an AG allele, then uh, it will give you 5% advantage. So I was fascinated by this idea, and uh, one of my friends has a biotech company. I called him right away, and I said, can I come and do my DNA sequencing? <laughs> I was fascinated by the idea, out of curiosity. So I went to his company to do my genetic uh, test, but I said, you don't have to do the whole sequence. You just focus on the RS4950. And they came back that I have the double G allele, the 30% advantage, but not the double A allele. <laughs> so there is no doubt, seriously, uh, the, the study has not been replicated yet. It is still very, I would say, archaic, and uh, it's the first of its kind to show, and there may be a genetic basis uh, to create leaders. But uh, there is no doubt the question of born or made will continue to be a subject of debate in the 21st century. But there is also a genetic mystery in Xenophon's text that I have been reflecting in over the years. If you read Kirupedia carefully, you will notice that Xenophon casts a shadow on Cyrus's true lineage. At one point, he says, he knows that Cyrus is said to have been the son of Cabesis I. And it is generally agreed upon that Mundane is his mother. So in other words, he's said to have been the son of Cabesis and it is generally agreed mundane to be his mother. So Xenophon could have written, his father was Cabesis and his mother was mundane. Why cast a shadow? Does Xenophon want to imply that we are not sure if the king of Persians, Cambyses, was Cyrus's biological father? Or the mundane, the daughter of Astyagis, the king of Medes, was not his biological mother? Why the uncertainty here in these two statements? And by implying that Cyrus's three character traits have not come from a lineage of kings, Xenophon perhaps wants to state here that leadership is not a right by birth. He also leaves open another possibility, that Cyrus's early education in both the Persian and the Median courts trained him to become the charismatic leader. In fact, we can argue that Xenophon suggests that education is more important than nature. Take, for example, a story from Cyrus's youth. One day he returned from school 
as a young boy, and his father asked him what he learned today. And Cyrus said, I was punished for acting justly. How so, said his father. And Cyrus explained that there were two boys, one who was a very tall, large boy, and the other one was a very short, small boy. And uh, the large boy had a very small jacket that would have fit him, but it was his jacket. And the small boy had an extra large jacket that was too big for him. And uh, the, the tall boy suggested that they exchange jackets so both jackets would fit nicely on each one of them. And the small boy refused to accept that. And then the tall boy forced an exchange of jackets. And the young Cyrus in the class learning justice, he had to be the judge. And he ruled in favor of the exchange because the jackets fit, fit both of them. And yes, Cyrus said, but my teacher pointed out that I was not made to judge which jacket best fit each boy, but to decide whether it was just for the large boy to take the jacket from the small boy without his consent. And for this, the teacher decided that Cyrus chose unjustly and therefore deserved to be punished. This is one of the stories you read in Giru Pedia. He learned that what is lawful is just, what is unlawful is violent and unjust. So for justice to prevail, the law must be obeyed even when the law may be seen unfair or unreasonable. It is the claim of ownership. There is a family with a very large home and they have no children. And then there is a family with five children and a very small home. Doesn't mean they can force an exchange. It's the right of ownership. So you cannot have the exchange without the consent of the owner. Justice in this case is the claim of ownership and Cyrus judged wrong. Later, this is much later, building the empire. And uh, uh, there is a similar scene of the two jackets. And Basirus proposes an alliance of land sharing between the Armenians and the Kaltaians. And although Cyrus has the authority and the power and the army and the means to enforce the feeding arrangement, he doesn't do it because he learned his lesson of justice as a child, the importance of education. Instead, he creates an environment where both sides are allowed to express their opinions, negotiate where he's the arbitrator, and through his education in the Persian and Median courts, Cyrus learned important lessons about leadership. Cyrus also learned from the negative examples around him. Despite his affection for his grandfather Astyaeus, Cyrus avoids the excess of food, drink, sex, and of course, extreme tyranny in his grandfather's court. The young Cyrus even criticizes his grandfather for the lack of self-restraint. How did he win over others? In addition to being gentle, sympathetic, and attended to the needs of others, he also gave gifts. When he was just 12 year old boy and he was sitting at the table of his grandfather, Cyrus gave food to the servants as a gesture of gratitude. Xenophon's Cyrus is a very compassionate man. He is the most compassionate character in the book. Despite of all Cyrus's wonderful traits, in Cyropedia, Xenophon reminds us of the harsh realities of leadership. And he points out that the loyalty of followers and direct reports always comes 
from self-interest. When those followers believe or learn that their leader can be vulnerable, their sense of loyalty collapses. Xenophon addresses this when his Cyrus captures Babylon and establishes a new administration, how to rule the whole empire that he built. He ensures, for example, competition is in place among his direct reports, the direct lieutenants. He ensures that there is competition among them. This keeps them busy competing with each other instead of talking behind his back, second guessing his decisions, or plotting against him. In her acclaimed and award winning book, Team of Rivals, Doris Goodwin details how, for example, Abraham Lincoln used a similar approach by bringing together, as members of his cabinet, an eclectic group that they were all former competitors. They wanted to be president. But he was the one who won the election. But he brought all of them as members of his cabinet for the presidency in order to create a team that could preserve the union and win the civil war. In many ways, the, competi the competition among his cabinet members, the team of rivals, also followed Xenophon's advice very well and kept them from attacking Lincoln at every step along the way. They were arguing with each other instead of arguing with the president. There is one more thing about direct reports. You cannot be an effective leader and be their friend at the same time. If you don't keep some distance of authority, you will have difficulty imposing discipline when it's needed. Xenophon tells a great story about how when Cyrus was younger, he was attracting support from the army. And his uncle, Siazaris, the king of Medes, started to become jealous of the younger Cyrus, who was already acting like a king. While Cyrus was trying to establish his own independence as a young leader, Xenophon also describes how he went out of his way to make his uncle, Siazaris, feel secure and comfortable. During times of transition from one leader to the other, leaders must work to establish independence, but also must honor the previous leader because their followers may still be allied with them. I have to tell you that I personally experienced this three times going through transitions. I could even write a book just on transitions of leadership. And when, and, uh, uh, and you really have to be very, very careful, especially if you are the up and coming leader. When you are a new leader, especially if things are going well, you need to pay attention to potential jealousies and vindictiveness from the others. Also, when you are in a leadership position, never assume that those who are constantly praising you are really your friends. And I have a personal story to share with you. But it's true. In Alicia. In 1991, long time ago, that was uh, one year after I arrived at the University of Southern California as a professor of electrical engineering, I was promoted to associate dean for research in the engineering school. And along with the school's chief financial officer, this gave me a significant authority and a say to allocate to faculty a lot of research money, research funds, from certain foundations that they were supporting the school. And right away, I got a visit from a senior professor of electrical engineering. He was the nicest guy, praising my academic work, my publications, my record of accomplishments, you name it, 
He loved it. And he said, I'm thrilled that we recruited you. And I want you to know that I was on the dean's faculty committee that reviewed your tenure appointment to join USC. And I'm thrilled that we recruited you. And I have to admit, I was very flattered. For the next decade, I worked with him and provided substantial support for his research. I mean, he would come to me almost every other year. So over a period of 10 years. And fast forward in 2001, 10 years later, I am named the dean of the engineering school. And out of curiosity, towards the end of the first month of my deanship, I go to my executive assistant one day and I said, don't we have the files of all faculty here in the dean's office? He said, yeah, I have them right here in my cabinet. I said, tell on a lot of fucking lomu. I want to see my own file, okay? Which is kept secret, okay, in the school. Only the dean can look at it. And he brings me the file. And looking through the paperwork, I found the recommendations from the dean's faculty committee in 1991. The vote for me to join the faculty was unanimous, except one vote that was negative. And guess who cast the negative vote? Aftos <laughs> Pudabireola. The guy whose research I supported for the past decade. Instantly I realized his first visit was not about friendship, and it was to cover his tracks. Like all followers, he was acting out of his own self-interest. And he probably thought, I would never find out. And that's true, because what were the chances becoming the dean of the school, right? So looking back over my own career, I believe there are two main factions that are essential for leaders of every organization. The first one involves the manner in which the leader articulates the vision of the institution or the country. And the second involves the manner in which they respect and nurture the tra the, their traditions and symbols. In creating an articulated vision, the successful leader is guided by philanthropia and wisdom. They see in their mind's eyes a compelling destiny into the future for the institution. This vision should be larger than any one person and everyone in the institution should feel they have a stake in the vision. The leader ensures that the key stakeholders of the institution buy into this vision. Their vision creates an expectation that once it is achieved, things will be better than they are today. It is a fact of life that a truly compelling vision often seems unreasonable to many people, to followers, to shareholders, to the media, to the general public. The Xenophon noted that leaders should be prepared for the likelihood that early on, no one will share their vision or believe it is attainable. The skepticism is what scares away most leaders from ever articulating a great vision in the first place. So it requires persistence, it requires endurance, it requires an unreasonable confidence that the goal can be achieved. The leader must see it to, uh, seek to exude the conviction that not only are our highest goals possible, but we are also destined to achieve them. However, a great leader must be both a skilled strategist and an effective tactician. For all leaders, the top of any profession or organization is always a lonely place. Some have described the role of a CEO as cold and empty. It is always important to know yourself, studying your faults and weaknesses, and always surrounding yourself with people who can bring strengths that you don't have. 
Those who lack this self-knowledge can bring about unnecessary challenges to themselves and to the institution. It is also important to guard your ambition, especially when you are on course to achieve remarkable things. When everything seems to be going well, this is when you need to proceed with tremendous care and caution. I said it before, never underestimate the envy and jealousy of other people, even among your closest followers when you achieve noteworthy or surprising milestones. In the face of these challenges, you must always display self-confidence side by side with humility. And even when you do, be prepared to be criticized, regardless, for not being humble because of the magnitude of your success. In times of tough decisions, you must try to be free of emotions, but it is never easy. I personally liken leadership to the metaphor of fighting a war. On a daily basis, you are getting up every morning and you are preparing to go to battle. Expect to lose some battles, but make sure the war is tilting your way. The late uh, Professor Water Bennis used to say, you've got to love it, otherwise why do it? I say, your heart should be singing every morning that you get up. Do not expect that the gratitude of the people that your leadership benefited will last long. Your followers always have short memories and they can be easily influenced by other people with different interests and agendas. Winston Churchill won World War II for Britain, and yet he was voted out at the end of World War II. The British felt they didn't need him anymore. Miltiades won the Battle of Marathon, and Athens was saved from Persian domination. One year later, Miltiades' former service was forgotten and his political rivals conspired to put him in prison when he died. The Spartans, as we all know, and uh, uh, Professor Platias can tell us more about it, the Spartans feared Themistocles so much so that they began a misinformation campaign with unfounded allegations against him, similar to what we call fake news today. With unfor which unfortunately found fertile ground among the Athenian citizens. Themistocles was ostracized and eventually exiled from Athens. This is the leader who saved the young democracy of Athens by orchestrating and winning the most decisive battle of Western civilization. The best a leader can do is have peace of mind and not expect any recognition. One of the mo best quotes about the legacies of leaders is from a book published in 1929 as a novel, The Magnificent Obsession, written actually by a Christian priest, minister, Lloyd Douglas. And I'm quoting, the quote reads, your awareness is sufficient reason to be happy and proud of what you have done as a leader. It does not require validation by other people. In closing, leadership, I believe, should not be over romanticized. As human beings, all leaders bear burdens and imperfections. Even the most admired leaders of history have never attained the ideal leader status of Xenophon's Cyrus. The best ones continually aim for that ideal without ever reaching it. Throughout Cyropedia, Xenophon Cyrus always makes the right decisions. He never makes a mistake. The, only, the first mistake that he made as a 12-year-old judging wrong 
in the two jackets story. From that moment on until he died, he never makes a mistake. Xenophon's prince. He is the ideal leader. However, we can argue, I can argue, he probably makes two mistakes, not one. Yes, the first one, he doesn't judge correctly in the two boys' jagged incident when he was 12 years old. But also, we can argue, he made a mistake that after his death, Xenophon's Cyrus empire collapses because his sons did not have the same character traits as their father. So in Girubedia, all this empire collapses. Okay? So we have to ask ourselves, did Cyrus fail? He made a mistake in his succession plan? He must have known his children did not have the same character traits as he did. He must have known that they cannot manage the empire. So why have them inherit the empire? So did he really make a mistake? Or, or is it because Xenophon wants to emphasize the importance of having one great leader? We see, for example, very successful corporations. I see them in the United States, in Wall Street. And then the CEO changes. Just one person replaced. And then the whole company, a few years later, goes downhill. And then you say, what the hell happened? Just one person replaced at the top, and the whole thing goes downhill. So just by replacing one person, well, the author of Bodil Dew, who published a book on Cyropedia, points out that the message from Kirubedia is not so much the systems of governance, the different committees, the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, the policies that you have in place that allow an organization to thrive. Sure, you need all that. But that's not what allows an organization to thrive. What allows the organization to thrive, assuming you've got all these necessary conditions, is the leadership of the one person at the top. And that's one of the big messages from Cyropedia. And perhaps that's why Xenophon has the empire collapsing because the charismatic leader is no longer at the top. And if you don't have that one charismatic leader at the top, you have to expect that your empire will collapse. So in closing, Xenophon stresses the absolute necessity that without the highest possible standout qualities in one leader at the top of the state, the army, the institution, or even the family, there is no hope of success or stability, and thus no hope of improving the sad and confused conditions of human life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Nikias, for this. Uh, extraordinary speech on leadership. Uh, I have many questions. Uh, everybody here has many questions and counter arguments as well, which shows how successful your speech was. And I'm sure I'm talking on behalf of the audience here and of the audience that's online. But uh, I would like only to stress two points that you mentioned, or three. Further, it's lonely at the top. Randy Newman. And cold. <laughs> and cold. <laughs> Second, nobody's entitled to leadership by birth. And third, uh, leadership is a talent that has to be worked out all the time. So, without further ado, I'd like to give the word to Professor Melina Tamnulaki, uh, who joins us here uh, from the University of Crete. She's a professor in the Department of um, Classics, and she studies uh, ancient Greek literature 
and she gets into history from that part of uh, the humanities. She's written extensively in her impressive uh, bio about uh, Xenophon, but also Thucydides, Polybius, who was inspired by him, Socrates, and uh, others. And I would like to hear her views now uh, from uh, that part of uh, analysis. Uh, yes, um, here the, uh, the, our, my colleague and uh, chair of the department reminds me of the time. We have uh, about 30 minutes uh, and we have to wrap it up in a way that is going to uh, allow us to take also some questions from the audience in the end. And we just heard uh, there's one person that should have all the power and that's the moderator today. So we're just increasing your power. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, Talking about leadership. But departmental meeting, uh, we'll see about that, what happens. <laughs> Next one. Thank you. So, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. I would like to thank warmly Professor Platias and Professor Nikias for the invitation. And I was uh, really glad to, to hear this talk, which actually testifies to this intersection between philology and political science and also uh, the experience that you described from leadership um, were very valuable. So I will uh, pick up some points. Actually, um, uh, first of all, about um, Xenophon. Uh, Xenophon was an unconventional personality. I see some students here. I don't know if students have already been taught. Um, he was born uh, in uh, 431 when the Peloponnesian War broke out. Um, so um, during his lifetime, um, the Athenian Empire um, uh, collapsed, OK? Uh, so then the cities in Greece uh, were struggling for, for hegemony, and Xenophon, as well as other authors of that period, tried to think about alternative solutions. So we can think about the Seropedia in this framework um, as an attempt to, um, uh, to propose uh, some ideas about good leadership. And it is also interesting, for example, that, uh, that Xenophon does not really uh, connect the Constitution to the good leadership. He doesn't say, for example, that I prefer uh, democracy or aristocracy uh, or oligarchy. He says that the good leader may exist everywhere, so regardless of the Constitution. Okay. So he was very much inspired by, by this uh, historical context. Um, this is my, my first point. Um, the second point about the, the Seropedia. Um, it's a very interesting work, in my opinion, Max's opinion, but it was not like that in the past. In the past, it was considered very boring, <coughs> very dull, and we have views, for example, of the 19th century scholars um, uh, and um, uh, uh, people, students of Xenophon who were saying that, okay, this is a dull and tedious work because it's boring that he always succeeds, okay? Um, uh, everybody agrees with Cyrus all the time, Cyrus succeeds all the time. Um, uh, but over the last years, um, there has been a trend, and uh, there is also an American philosopher who has greatly contributed to that, and this is Leo Strauss. Uh, a trend to, to see uh, the Cyropedia as a more sophisticated work. And um, I would like to, to point out some um, uh, issues that show this sophistication. For example, um, Xenophon says uh, in many points in this work that um, it's very, very important to, to acquire the will of obedience of the followers. Uh, but then uh, we see that this will of obedience is often blurred with slavery. So, so what is the limit? When, when are we simply obedient and when, when do we become slaves? This is something that uh, the Seropedia allows us to explore without always giving you know, uh, clear-cut answers. Another issue is persuasion. Why does a leader persuade? Does he persuade because he has arguments or simply because he has status? Uh, for example, uh, when Cambyses talks with uh, his son, Cyrus, um, <coughs> he, he tells him that um, uh, you will be able to, to convince your soldiers because you will have the power and because you will have the, the power to give them you know, the, the necessary, so they will, in a sense, be dependent on you. Um, and then later we, we read that Cyrus says that, okay, uh, speeches may not be 
so um, uh, so important and um, uh, bravery of heart is more important. So uh, this is another issue that is problematized in the seropedia. Um, another one is uh, the relationship between Haris and Phobos. For example, the leader can persuade by by his Haris, by his charisma, uh, but he can also persuade by fear, by coercion. And there are examples like that uh, in, in the Seropedia. So uh, Cyrus um, is successful because he is both, in a sense. Uh, he can use both. And then there is the great um, issue about benefaction, which is a central xenophontic idea that a good leader is the leader uh, who can be a benefactor to his followers. Uh, so benefactor in, in, in every sense, material goods, um, uh, ethical examples, all, all this. Um, but again, uh, it's obvious that um, uh, Xenophon is aware of the complexity of the difficulty of this because he presents Cambyses telling his son, uh, Cyrus, that uh, it's difficult to be a benefactor, but you can have a second best solution. For example, share the emotions of your followers. Try to, to be compassionate. Uh, so it's, it's interesting that the Seropedia shows many ways, many ways of success for the leadership and, and many examples. Um, the issue of education, of course, is, is very important, as um, Max pointed out, and um, uh, it's true that Cyrus' education only refers to the first book, uh, but uh, perhaps Xenophon wanted to, to show in this way that education is something continuous, something which, uh, which never ends. Uh, so, um, in the end, um, uh, how, how I, I read the, the Seropedia, I, I read the Seropedia as a test. I think that um, Xenophon um, actually asks us to, to reflect, to reflect on uh, all these issues and to try to find solutions. Um, in, in the Seropedia, we may find even contradictory portraits of, of Cyrus. For example, another mistake, uh, because Max talked about mistakes, uh, in the first book, um, Cyrus uh, tells his uh, grandfather uh, that, oh, you, you are wearing very luxurious clothes and I don't like <coughs> these clothes. But then, when he becomes an emperor, he also adopts this luxurious style. He starts uh, <coughs> becoming more distant, adopting more uh, tyrannical traits. So Cyrus is again a contradictory uh, figure. Um, so uh, Xenophon uh, invites us to, to reflect uh, on, uh, on these uh, issues and to, to decide uh, eventually uh, what makes the good leader. And finally, a last point, we, we should also Bear in mind that Xenophon was Socrates' pupil, so these two basic traits of a successful leader, knowledge and virtue, these are Socrates', uh, Socrates ideas. Socrates believed that uh, a good leader is somebody who, who knows, who has the expertise, and also has the virtue. So uh, Xenophon's uh, ideas are also framed by the Socratic uh, tradition. So this is my comment. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Great, thank you very much. And now we're moving to Professor Platias, who is a worldwide uh, 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 researcher on Thucydides, to tell us his view on Xenophon's Chiropedia. Thank you, Max. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, as you said, Xenophon used Cyrus to say his story. And I think you have used Xenophon to say your story. I mean, uh, and <laughs> I hope that the book that you will write on this issue will be as successful as Xenophon's book. Okay, let me try to bring some comments from the international relations perspective. Uh, first of all, you did uh, a very important, you make a very important point which is relevant for our students. 
that leadership matters because in international relations we usually deal with structural forces, uh, balance of power, uh, interest, things that are not controlled. Uh, this kind of structural analysis is relevant in Marxism, but it's very uh, central to the, the basic realist approach, which is structural realism. And you said agency matters, leader, leader matters. And you have really showed that it does, leadership matters. And uh, the case that you used for that, Cyrus, uh, is fascinating because he was no, his actions were not determined by the system, but he determined the system. And I mean, he was empire builder. He built power. He managed uh, the Persians, the, as the map shows, uh, essentially they occupied for, uh, himself and his, fall, uh, his son, uh, and then Darius occupied for empires. So actually, individuals save the systems that are being saved. That's a very important uh, lesson uh, for, for our students that more or less we talk to, we, we talk to them uh, for, in a kind of abstract structural level. Uh, now, the issue why Xenophon was fascinating by Cyrus, I will say why also Herodotus was fascinating. Because if you read Herodotus carefully, is the basic protagonist, Cyrus. Uh, so uh, the, the Greeks have been fascinating. These maps, these maps show why. Look at this empire, and the Greeks are actually city-states. You see city-states living next to this empire, the empire that Cyrus created. So that's the fascination of, for the... Uh, for Cyrus and, uh, and the Persian Empire and being empire builder. Now, let me start bringing some points that I start disagreeing with you. I mean, you brought charisma uh, as the main threat of the leader uh, and, and generally threats. But you see, charisma is very difficult to institutionalize. So uh, Max Weber wrote a whole book on leadership on, on how to, to create mechanism to institutionalize charisma. And a different branch, uh, a different approach that comes from sophists uh, and has influenced my thinking is to really look at the mechanisms that the leaders use to generate power and achieve their objectives. It's not if it's good or bad, just or not. It's if, if, if he knows politics, if he knows the art of politics and the art of leadership. And this is something that we teach. I mean, the sophists were teaching, and that's what we teach here in our department. We try to make leaders, and we try to teach them the mechanisms of leadership in order to, 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 to be able to, to succeed. So oh, I tend to oh, de-emphasize the importance of threats, and uh, I, I looked at it mostly uh, as an art, if you know how to do it. And this, can, of course, can be taught. Now. On what makes a great leader? Uh, Xenophon finished the history of the Peloponnesian War that Thucydides started to, to, to write. So uh, Thucydides uh, tried to answer this question, what makes a great leader? And he used the last speech of Pericles. Uh, you know, when the Athenians had the problem, they had the plague, things were not going well, they were accusing Pericles. So Pericles gave a speech. And he said, look, why you accuse me? Let's see what's the criteria of success. The leader needs to know what to do. In other words, to make strategy. Strategy means to have the ends, the vision, as you said, to generate the means, and know how to use uh, the ways that you use to means to achieve the ends. That's the rational part of strategy. That I know. Then he said, if I know strategy, but I was not be able to persuade you, nothing would have happened. So the second characterization of the leader is to be able to persuade others to follow his strategy, to follow or his vision. Now, this comes, again, from the art of politics, rhetoric. That's what sophists were teaching, and that's what 
the great leaders like Pericles and uh, Themistocles were using. And the third is to put the public good, the public interest, on top of the private interest. Uh, which, now, these are the criteria, and I think these are universal. That's more or less how we judge our leaders today. We have elections in about uh, uh, one, month. Uh, one month. This is how, uh, theoretically, we judge our leaders. Now, a central art, it's not really, what is virtue? Virtue is not moral virtue. It's a political virtue. And the political virtue is prudence. And prudence, it's characterized, at least according to Thucydides, on, by three elements. One is rationality. And I explain is uh, to know what to do. Vision, means, sense, ways. The second is control of emotions. And you mentioned that. Uh, and you use the word restraint. But restraint is not just personal. The leader has to restrain his followers. He has to lead the followers and restrain them. I mean, Pericles was the controller of emotions. I mean, when the Athenians, they were overconfident, he tried to let, get them down. When after the plague were uh, kind of pessimistic, he tries to raise his, um, uh, their, their morale. So leader, Yes, it's emotion, but it's not just personal. Uh, it's how to be able to, 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 to control emotions. And the third, and actually most important, is to control uncertainty and lack. Uh, because shit happens. <coughs> and uh, the question is how, how, how oh, and he, this is the art of foresight. I mean, Themistocles was a great leader because he could uh, foresee things. Uh, anyhow, it's a fascinating word, uh, the Xenophon Cyropedia. It has uh, been used for Machiavelli uh, because it started a new genre of writing, uh, which we call the Mirror of Princess, how to give advice to the princess. And it has a long tradition. Probably one of the best books, even better than uh, Machiavelli, is Cautillas. Uh, book of Tharasustra. And there he solves the problem that you say, if your successor, your boy is not good to succeed you, you kill it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you, you know, there is more radical. radical. Uh, <laughs> Machiavelli. Uh, others have solved this problem. And, and actually, Machiavelli uh, tried try to solve uh, the, this problem. I mean, on Machiavelli, uh, the political virtues are more important than moral virtues. But the beauty of Xenophon uh, was that he really tried uh, to, to reconcile these two things. And uh, I think he has succeeded on that. So thank you for bringing to us and to our students this fascinating uh, story of uh, Xenophon's Cyropedia, which helped you to say your story, which is also fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Professor Etziabiris, who I think uh, profited the most today as he's writing a book on Cyropedia, Kilpedia. I need a couple more years, to, but it's, I'm getting uh, there. To tell us what he learned from today's discussion. So thank you very much. I'll try to be very uh, fast because I can talk very fast. Some things I'd like to address very quickly. What is this book about? What is the genre? Uh, say something about the romance in it. Uh, the fascination with empire, and finally, why does it end the way it does? And here I'll have a radically different interpretation, um, and uh, I'll try to do it in, uh, in, le in eight minutes tops. So first of all, Xenophon, at the very beginning of the book, in his own voice, says, this is a book about political stability. I want to write a book that deals with the issue of political stability. I take this very seriously. But that in itself is not conclusive. He writes the um, uh, anabasis, and nine-tenths of the book is about a katabasis. So just because an ancient author, Bonnerov, says something, we need to scrutinize that. But without any doubt, <coughs> he says that. And then we have the title, Kirupedia. Pedia is 
an education is a common thread through every single one of Xenophon's books, be it a technical treatise, he's trying to teach us something. So pedia uh, is, uh, is like the common denominator in everything in a very prolific author. The genre, the genre is basically one of the first novels ever. He invents characters, he invents dialogues, he ev invents uh, ev events. This is a novel. It's fiction, philosophical fiction, based on some real events, but it's really one of the first novels in the Western world. He's, he's not just a, a, a mirror princess, which it is, but through a fictionalized account, and that's mind-blowing. This is a novel, 2,400 years ago. We thought it's the 16th, 17th century. Think again. It starts almost with Xenophon, one of the very first. So why? Do you do a novel? I can think of two reasons very quickly. One is it's malleable. You can fix it. Any it, history is history. I mean, you cannot really it's change it. It's and, and fiction. Yes, together. yes, it's, it's a combination. But if you're if you if, if you're trying to do history, you cannot invent people who didn't exist. That's not history. If it's a novel, you can. But there's also one other thing that I'd like you to think. His big his teacher Socrates wrote nothing, and they still killed him. A Fictionalized account protects you. What is Xenophon really saying? We're debating it 2,000 years later. It's a protection in a period where one of the people, one of the most important people was killed for writing nothing, just for talking. Uh, why the Romans? I have to say, I think uh, Sir Philip Sidney in his An Apology for Poesy says that uh, Xenophon is a poet. And I think there's something to it as well. Uh, even the million uh, dialogue, it's done in such a drama, Athenians, millions, Athenians. So, so there's a little competition going on, and I think he does want to show uh, his talents, and um, Panthea is the big romance there, and I have to conclude uh, to, to actually agree with uh, President Kies, but I'll go a step further. I think he's actually even harsher. It's not just me too, don't screw around. This is the perfect marriage. It's so... Passionate, and he says it's too passionate if you want to do leadership. So Cyrus's wife, he, she's there. They have kids. That's about it. So he's a little bit more um, uh, strict on this, uh, even uh, with um, uh, even even than us. Why empire? He's dealing with empire. Remember city states, the, the polis, but he, he wants to do an empire. I think all he had to do. Uh, some people say, did he predict? Uh, Macedonian Empire? No, he, he couldn't. Did he see the Roman Empire? No, but he all, all he had to do, uh, just to paraphrase uh, A.J.P. Paraphrase, uh, Taylor, is predict his, the present. The present was uh, a, a, a tendency, even in the Greek world, towards bigger structures. The Athenian Empire uh, lost. Now it, the Spartans in control. So he was seeing that we were moving towards bigger political units, and so he had to, I think, think about that and that's why he was so popular in Roman times, and that's why I think Alexander the Great uh, wrote him. But I think that's, he was just seeing reality. Now the end, and I conclude with that, and this is my, this is how I think I will conclude. One, uh, I'm going to go to if this happens. Uh, so, so you read this book, and, you know, Cy, uh, yes, he now is more autocratic. He has his eyes and his ears, and he, he, he's now an emperor, okay? And he rules the world, this big empire. He's different. But he's successful. He made it. And then Xenophon says, but his son screwed up and the empire was lost. And in fact, some people in the 19th century, even in the 20th, argued this is uh, not part of, uh, of the book because it's, it's spurious. Because how can this be uh, a part of this book? It doesn't really compute. But I think it's integral to the argument. I think there are two things. One, I'll conclude with uh, very much with what Professor Rakia says, and then I'll do my so uh, I think that Xenophon is saying what we realists in international relations theories know that political life is a tragedy. You expect empires and stability forever? Uh, when did that happen? It just doesn't happen historically forever. It might happen for a few years, even a few centuries. Uh, a famous book is The Tragedy of Great Power Competition, or just read Thucydides. Uh, the, the fact that an empire, a good empire, run by a good person doesn't last, hello, that's real life. Wake up. That's how the world works, even if you have a perfect leader. But, and I conclude with this, you don't have a perfect leader. Why? Not 
because he's made one or two or three mistakes, because of human nature. Human nature is not perfect. Hence, you cannot have perfect leadership. You can have great leadership, but not perfect. And now here's where I think it gets interesting. We have the example, fictional, <coughs> because you can only find it in fiction, of the greatest leader who actually starts this great empire, the biggest empire of his time, okay? So the most successful person of the time builds an empire. A man of action can do this. Now, what happens to this empire? We can only see it in maps. It's gone, doesn't exist, didn't exist for long, even in antiquity. But there's something else. We are talking here about a man of action, a successful man of action. But we're reading about him in a book. A book is written by a man of thinking. Sure, Xenophon was also a man of action, but he's also a philosopher and a writer and a thinker and a student of Socrates. Let's, let me not forget this. Can we, let's compare for a moment the perfect example of the life of the mind, Socrates, and by extension to a lesser extent, Xenophon, with the life of action, the empire that doesn't exist. Xenophon still does. We're doing a, uh, an event on him today. The empire's gone. I think that in a very Socratic way, Xenophon is saying that ultimately the life of the mind, and I think he was just as good with that, is ultimately higher and better than the most successful life of action. In this sense, the word pedia in the title is very ironic. How Socratic? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, it seems that uh, Xenophon was a genuine child of Socrates. Uh, Socrates, in the first lines of his apology, wrote about his fear of Thonos and Sycophantes. Right. Just like you said, Max. We have some minutes for questions. If you have any questions, uh, please state your name and uh, the question you have. We can but take we only from, have five uh, minutes because uh, Professor we have another and another Dr. Vasily Stringas. We take them all, all together and they will be answered all together. together. Just name whom you would like to uh, refer to. Professor Hadzi Manuel, you have the word. Is there a microphone to uh, go around? No, you have a centurion voice. Yeah, I do. <laughs> we know. <laughs> Look to uh, North Korea, 
Okay, this is a comment uh, or a question. <laughs> Max, would you like to, yeah, can I, to answer? Uh, <coughs> one, one thing, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't mention it in my talk, but uh, uh, there are some papers, uh, some work done uh, more recently that, uh, and I think uh, Professor Damiolagi alluded to it, that uh, once Cyrus establishes, he went through the education of the two courts, the Persian and the Median court. The Persian one, he learned to respect the law that nobody is above the law. And, uh, and of course, there is the example of justice and a number of other examples. But his grandfather, as the I, is the media court, he was a tyrant. He made the law. Whatever he said, that's the law. Uh, so, and, uh, and that's why uh, Xenophon has a beautiful dialogue between uh, the young Cyrus and his mother, uh, mundane that the mother is terrified to leave the kid with his grandfather because he's going to be spoiled with the excessive drinking, dancing, womanizing, uh, uh, not respecting the law, making the law, and so on. And there is this beautiful dialogue that Cyrus understands all that, shows self-restraint, but he still wants to stay in the grandfather's court because he wants to learn horseback riding uh, and uh, hunting. So, <clears throat> much later, and that's the more, some more recent publications, the way he establishes to run the empire, he becomes more of a figure face, he pays attention to how he dresses, uh, he has security all, all around him, and the lieutenants uh, that, uh, they're the direct reports running the empire. The similarity there, is the large corporation multinational of today. It's one thing when Jeff Bezos was the CEO of Amazon in the 90s, that was a small company growing up. His role as a CEO back then, and what it was 20 years later, was very different. A large corporation has the executive team, let's say a corporation of 20 or 50 or 100,000 employees worldwide, the executive team is no more than 25 or 30 people. And that's the close team that runs the empire, has the oversight. And the CEO has to pay attention to his or her tweets every day, has to go to Congress and testify, has to be, even when he's casually dressed, has to be very careful how he or she looks. So this blending of tyranny, the Persian and the Median way of, of government, that's what the modern corporation is all about. And uh, there, as I said, there are some papers published, and uh, that could be another way to look at Cyropedia especially building an empire from a small company and going to a very large one, and the role of the CEO if it's the same one, Zuckerberg with Facebook, his role has changed over 20 years from the moment he started Facebook to what Facebook is today. Uh, unfortunately, we will have to end it here, but... I Sorry, sorry, there's a, there's a question here, okay, and there's okay. a question there. Okay. Just, more questions just, just, just the question. Yes. You, 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 you were, were the first. That was truly fascinating. Thank you so much for the extraordinary presentation. Now, I think we all agree that the tip of the tip speaks from the top, leadership matters. What happened with the quality of the tip, the most recent paper of the day? Is the tip the same right now? In the United States, the tip is the quality.
condition that was part of the habit of the public in the United States. On the other hand, in the East, not going to North Korea, for instance, you have to believe that Victor Hoyle and Lindsay Peterson maddened the imperial Soviet population. So how can we balance these two conflicting views about the significance of leadership in a highly competitive space in the whole region? I need to hopefully clarify this. Well, from you. Max, your last word. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's true. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the shit. There, there is a, a, there is a paper published. Uh, I think uh, Antonina probably you've seen it by by John Ray. It was about 15, 16 years ago, where he takes the Cyropedia of Xenophon and says. George Washington, the founder of the American Republic, uh, he was like Xenophon Cyrus. He had the traits, he had this, he had that, so, uh, which was based on a paper published by someone else who studied 200 years earlier, maybe 30. However, there is a big difference. Xenophon's prince, his empire collapses after his death. George Washington, New Republic survives because he has the constitution, the leader changes everything. So in other words, George Washington, yeah, probably it's true, he had many of the traits and uh, charismas and everything that is described in Cyropedia for, for Cyrus. But the system of government that he established he was established with strategy. And by the way, he was offered to become the king. And he refused. He wanted it a republic. That's how they came up with the constitution of a modern republic. So, uh, so, but still, even for that republic to flourish, the leadership of the one person at the top really matters. Although there are the constraints legislative constraints, it's only the executive branch of the government. Uh, actually, our founding fathers, they were so terrified that even in the executive branch, the president may start behaving like a king, and they wanted to have a committee, like the Romans, that they had two governors on the executive, not one person. So finally, they agreed on the president. And then, even um, Alexis Tocqueville, in the 1830s, he said the executive branch is the weakest of the three because it's only going to become important if uh, this, um, this American Republic uh, is 
is going to um, is going to participate in international matters. But there is no way this is going to happen because Europe is where international matters take place and it's divided by a, by an ocean. Did not anticipate the airplanes, you know, all the other transportation system. And that's why today the executive branch has become so powerful because it matters in international affairs. If I may just so, add something um, very quickly, it's the fact uh, you might say, for Z uh, you, you pointed this out, the regime doesn't matter in Xenophon, uh, leadership is what matters. Uh, but that's a word, in a, in, a, in a work of fiction, yes. In real life, not so much. Thank you very much uh, for everything. Okay. And uh, <laughs> Professor <laughs> So we vote for both leaders and systems. <laughs>